via telephone, Secretary of State Mac Warner, candidate for governor in the state as well. Mac, good morning to you, sir. Good morning. Great to be with you. Great to have you, too. Hey, uh, tell me about the uh, candidate debate, which uh, Patrick Morrissey was uh, missing, uh, by the <laughs> way. Uh, but you were present along with the other candidates for governor. Uh, the forum went great, uh, had a great discussion, gave each of the uh, candidates a chance to speak and talk about our policies and plans for West Virginia. And so uh, I think it was a well-done forum, and uh, I look forward to doing more of those type things. Any thoughts on Patrick not being present for that? We had him on the show yesterday. He said there was a scheduling conflict. He would welcome a debate at some point in the future. <laughs> oh, man. Uh, well, if you believe that, he, he didn't want to have to face the people of West Virginia and the hard questions and coming from out of state and uh, some of the positions he and then his wife and others have, have taken with regards to big farming and uh, now trying to deal with this opioid crisis and trying to take credit for that uh, trying to spin it into the positive, and I think Chris Miller did a decent job of calling him out on that in the debate, uh, that West Virginia deserved more with what we've suffered through that. But there are just many positions that he has taken, and uh, I don't think he wants to address the, the people of West Virginia. So uh, actually not having him there gave the rest of us more of an opportunity uh, to, to explain our positions. So I think it went just fine. What does uh, your camp's poll numbers show for you, Mac? Right now, it's um, Morrissey at 24, I'm at 21, Capito at 18, and Chris Miller at 11. The important thing there is that undecided, the people that are not responding right now, 20, 21% or so, and that's where the battleground is. That's just where we have to reach those. <clears throat> the big thing is is that uh, the other candidates don't have the favorable rating that I do. So <clears throat> let's say if you have four people that are undecided, three of those four, once they hear about me and my background and uh, credentials and so forth, they're going to go with me. Uh, the others are more like one-to-one. -one. Two would go with them, two would go against them. They, they have unfavorability. Uh, and it's just, I think, when we talked about Patrick Morrissey, it, it, there's just a likability factor that uh, doesn't go along with his candidacy. And so that's where the battle is. We need to reach those people. And that's why I appreciate being on a show like yours. People can uh, hear what I have to say. Uh, my demeanor, my approach to things. I have, I'm married. I've been married for 41 years. My wife and I will live in the governor's mansion. There's no hesitancy about that. There is hesitancy with some of the other candidates. So those are the type of things that I think people need to hear about and help make their decision when they see who do they want to represent the state of West Virginia, who do they want to be in the governor's seat when that next disaster hits or the next opportunity hits, uh, and I bring that wealth of experience that I don't think any of the others bring to the uh, bring to the table. Mac, we have an Eastern Panhandle here, a community that's growing quite quickly, and we have new members coming to it every single day. There's uh, another family that's moving to the Eastern Panhandle, uh, maybe 10, maybe 20 in a single day, depending. Uh, let's talk about your resume a little bit. For those who are new to this show and don't know much about you, tell us about what the accomplishments of Mac Warner have been since his college days. Well, I went to West Point, and then I joined the field artillery. I, I was in the Army and um, for a couple of years. And I mention that because of the engineering that goes into artillery. To put a piece of steel on a target 18 miles away, you have to have all the, the rotation of the earth. You have barometric pressure. You have uh, to get things uh, level. You, you have to know mathematics and physics and engineering to, to make that happen. And so that's kind of the background that I come from. But then my experience at West Point, um, I was on the honor committee there, and we went a, a huge uh, cheating scandal at the academy, and I tried a number of cases where my classmates were up on honor violations. And that introduced me to the law and that there are gray areas um, in the law in dealing with uh, infractions and so on. And then when I went to Panama with the 7th Infantry Division, I was the legal advisor there, and there was an international incident that my unit was involved in, and it thrust me into the international arena. So I got a law degree from WVU, I got an international law degree from the University of Virginia, and so for most of my career, then I spent as an international lawyer with the U.S. Army, and I was the chief of, in of uh, international law for the U.S. Army Europe while Bosnia was going on and uh, other events. I went to Ukraine and various places. So I've been pretty much around the world. Uh, I sent, went to Central America, Central America, South America in the drug wars. 
I mentioned Ukraine, and then following my military career, I went to the Afghanistan for five years with U.S. State Department, where I uh, was responsible for the world's largest rule of law program to try to implement a rule of law in Afghanistan. So the Ministry of Justice, the Supreme Court, the Attorney General's Office, and Ministry of Women, Women's Affairs were all under my purview. And I mention that because that's what the governor does. He takes care of large organizations, makes sure that the right people are in the right place, sets uh, agendas or uh, objectives and goals for them to accomplish. And so now I turn to my Secretary of State's job. That's what I've done as Secretary of State. I've worked with the 55 county clerks. We've changed the office dramatically. We've raised, risen to the top nationally in recognition for running free, fair, clean elections. And then also in the business world, we've changed the business climate, making it easier than ever to start a business in West Virginia. So that's just a, a shotgun approach of all the different things that I've been involved in. And I think that that's what you want with a governor because you never know what's going to come at the state, whether it's the opportunities, the disasters, the situations like we've had with the corrections facilities, with teachers, with the medical care uh, community. We have one not necessarily crisis after another, but challenges and hurdles with the opioid crisis and those sorts of things. And so this broad experience that I've had across the globe is what I intend to bring into the governor's office, put it to work for the people of West Virginia. And uh, um, Debbie and I, my wife and I, are thrilled to have this opportunity uh, to take this into the to the governor's mansion. And I mentioned Debbie again because she's been elected to the House of Delegates. She's in the House of Delegates right now. And who better than the two of us to coordinate with the state Senate, the House of Delegates, to move agendas forward for the people of West Virginia? Bill? Uh, good morning, Mac. Uh, I have a couple of points I want to make, uh, and I will pull them together for a single question. Uh First point is you have been very open in your reservation about the previous election. You felt you've gone so far, you say you thought it was stolen. Uh, and even though you've been very vocal, very open, it seemed to come as a surprise during the debate the other day when you started discussing this. I think you tied in the CIA that got it got a lot of folks' attention to it. Uh, so, <laughs> so again, there's been a lot of uh, uh, your position has been, I think, well received by some and questioned by others. Uh, the second sure. part to my the second point I'd like to make, and I weave these together, is there's a lot of dis, there's been a lot of rumors that you w hope to get and perhaps will get President Trump's endorsement. Uh, if are these, I assume these two together are are. are our purpose, our, a very clear purpose of trying to reach that group of West Virginia electorate that will, in fact, be a very strong supporter of President Trump, hence a strong support of you? Well, Bill, great, great question, and I'll respond by letting you know that I did not bring this up. This was in direct response to a question by Javi Kirchhoff, mm -hmm. the moderator, and he wanted to put us into a yes or no category. He asked, yes or no, was the 2020 election stolen? And so I appreciate the question because it gives me a chance here to explain a little bit that I did not have a chance to explain that evening. And, and the explanation is this. First, back on that background that you, you let me just address a minute ago, I was on that honor committee where the honor code says a cadet will not lie, cheat, or steal, or tolerate those who do. And you'll see the importance of that in just a second. And then we, every week at the academy, we prayed the uh, cadet prayer. And there are three main parts there. One, it says, endow us with courage to know no fear when truth and right are in jeopardy. Make us to choose the harder right instead of the easier wrong, and never to be content with a half-truth when the whole can be won. So now let's use, th th this is ingrained in me. Like I said, I prayed that every week at, at, at school. In the honor committee, uh, I, I tried a number of cases where that honor code was essential to whether this person was going to stay at the academy or be expelled. So now let's apply that to this election scenario that happened in 2020. Tony Blinken, who is our current U.S. Secretary of State, was then working. He was an operative for the Biden campaign. Three weeks before the election, he saw that the Hunter Biden laptop was going to become a major national news story. And he had to push back against that. So he came up with the idea and planted the seed inside the head of former CIA acting director Mike Morrell and said, this is Russian disinformation. And it was a complete fabricated lie. They knew that was not the truth, but they went ahead with it. And Morrell ran with it and got 51 so-called intelligent experts 
to sign a letter that said this has all the indicia of uh, Russian disinformation. So once that got out, Biden used that at the debate two weeks prior to the election. He threw that right back at Trump. When Trump brought it up, he said that has been debunked by 50 you know, intelligence experts. It was used. And that's what the voters went to the poll with was that information. And it was a lie. The FBI had had that laptop for 11 months and they knew that it was authentic. So here you have the CIA former director with these 50 experts lying to the American people on behalf of the Biden campaign. And this isn't my conjecture. This is under sworn testimony that uh, Mike Morrell gave back in March to uh, Jim Jordan, the House Judiciary Chair. He admitted that they did it to help Biden and that they knew that it was a lie. So then now we get to the toleration part. The FBI tolerated this. The FBI did not speak up and let the American people know. Just last week, uh, Senator John Kennedy from Louisiana asked Christopher Ray, the FBI director, why didn't you just tell the people the truth? Why didn't you let the American know? You didn't have to say that Hunter Biden was guilty. You didn't have to charge him. Just let them know that this Hunter Biden laptop was, was authentic. So that's the toleration part. And so I think that American democracy, you know, truth and right, right are in jeopardy here. If we don't do something about this, uh, let me ask you, or, you know, rhetorically, do you think three-lettered agencies should be determining the outcome of a presidential election in the United States? They might do that overseas. That's the area that the CIA works in. Is they, they're, they can do this, this sort of thing overseas. We do not want them operating inside the United States, pulling off a psychological operation, a lie to the American people. And that's what they did. They got away with it. The FBI tolerated. And then one more step, it gets worse. The FBI then colluded with big tech and told them to suppress the story. Mark Zuckerberg admitted to that on the Joe Rogan show. And so here you have three different things. You have the CIA lying to us. You have the FBI covering up. And then you have the FBI colluding with big tech to suppress this. That's why I conclude that this election was stolen or that it was unfair. It was improper. And so, you know, I'll shift real quickly to a, a football analogy. If a ref makes a bad call at the end of a game and it causes WVU to lose, what does everybody shout? The game was stolen. You know, it's a colloquial, it's a use of the word that it wasn't fair and, and that this election wasn't fair. And if we don't stop and talk about it and analyze what happened, then we're apt to let it happen again. So I appreciate you giving me the chance to, to explain my answer. But uh, I think that we – I owe it. I'm the chief elections officer for the state of West Virginia. I've seen this. I've read it. I've studied it. I've seen the testimony. I've been over on Capitol Hill myself to testify in front of Congress about West Virginia's success stories when this sort of thing came up. And it's interesting that I raised this back in April, and we put out a press release, my position on the election. And it didn't get any attention. But now that I'm running for governor, all of a sudden it's being made into a, a significant story. So, um, yes, I would love to have President Trump's uh, endorsement, but that's not the reason that this – it's not the reason I answered that. It's not the uh, background. Uh, I simply answered Hoppy Kirchhoff's question when he said yes or no, was the election stolen? If I had said no, I think I would have been lying to the people of West Virginia. Yeah, Mac, very quick follow-on to that. Are you making a distinction between influence an election and stealing an election? What you have mentioned about the CIA and the FBI and the like would, would infer to me that it's influence the outcome, but it would not be the actual stealing the election. I don't draw a distinction there. You okay. see, uh, now we get back to the honor code. There's such a thing as quibbling, and quibbling is a half-truth. And it, it doesn't matter how you steal that game or how you cheat the, at the game, you know, whether you play illegal, illegal players, whether you pay the money, whether you um, pay off the ref. Whether you, you know, there, there are all kinds of different ways. Back in 1990, there was the five-down play where Missouri uh, got beat by Colorado when Colorado got a fifth down, and that's when they scored. It, it's it's improper, you know. Was that game stolen? It, it, it's I guess you get into the definition of stolen. One definition of stolen is when you take something by trickery. And folks, and Bill, I think this election was taken by trickery, as I just described. Okay. Hey, Mac. This is John Gilstrap. Good morning. Sure. Stipulating to all of the above, um, that there's nothing to stipulate. That that's the stuff that happened. Mm -hmm. What is the relevance? 
of all of that that happened in 2020 at the national election, what's the relevance of that to the 2024 gubernatorial election in West Virginia? Sure. We certainly don't want that to happen again. And one, I think everybody in West Virginia, I hope that everybody knows we have free, fair elections. So when we talk about voter identification, when we have very specific days that the early voting occurs, when the ballots have to be in by election day or the day after if it doesn't have the postmark, we have very specific rules and regulations, and they have been outlined by the legislature. That's a key point here. When we had these other states, we had Pennsylvania that went outside their legislative authority and accepted ballots after the election was over. They allowed curing of the ballots after the election was over. Michigan allowed ballots that came in without signatures, without addresses, and they counted those votes. Those are votes outside the law, and I don't think votes outside the law should count. But if a board of canvassers agrees and lets them happen, then it's up to the people to get back to the legislature and correct those. So that's why all these things are important for us to be talking about, because we may need to get to the legislature. I I think we're fine in West Virginia, but other states should be getting to their legislature. And we saw in Wisconsin they did. Wisconsin allowed drop boxes, unsupervised drop boxes. And the people went to the legislature, and the legislature came back and said, nope, no more. You're not doing this without... Uh, or the court said you're not going to do that without specific legislative approval. So this isn't an area where you can just do something and get away with it. Now, they did in 2020, but we need to call them out on it. We need to identify what those issues are and make sure that doesn't happen again, because what does happen in Pennsylvania affects us in West Virginia. When they send the bad set of electors, and that's what the whole Texas case was about, that went to the Supreme Court, it wasn't decided on its merits. It was decided on standing, that they had picked the wrong plaintiff to take the suit forward, and that's why the Supreme Court kicked it back. So there are still merit, meritorious uh, cases that are out there, and we still need to look at those now so we get ready for the 24 election. I realize it's a long answer to your question, but we, if we don't look back at what happened before and fix it, then it's apt to happen again. Well, I, I'm not a politician. I'm not an election uh, expert on things. But it seems to me, and, and I respectfully request that you and all other Republicans that are out there be wary that the more politic, more conservatives are put in the position of of attacking the events of 2020, as true as they may be, that is a distraction from talking about future plans for the future to correct the, the current problems, you know, putting out positive, uh, positive plans to correct current problems. So I just, for what oh. that's worth, I throw that out there as a, as a non-politician. I, I appreciate that, and I would much rather be talking about my plans for the future of West Virginia. But again, this was asked of me directly by Hoppy Kirchville on the televised debate, and uh, I had to answer it. And once I answered it, then now it's, it's caused people to go back and say, okay, why is the chief elections officer in West Virginia saying that this election uh, was not fair? And that's what we're doing today is explaining that. Yeah, Mac, it was let, a juicy headline. Let me follow up on John's question. Looking forward now as opposed to backward, how does your forward vision differ from Chris Miller, um, Moore Capito, and Marcy? My focus is on education. The main thing we need to do in West Virginia is to fix our education system. And so, obviously, we've had the situation with teachers and pay, but it's much more than that. So I talk to the teachers. They want respect. They want to be able to discipline in their classroom when that student gets out of hand. They're spending more time fixing that one student and paying attention to that person that's causing problems than they are to the other 20 or 30 students in the classroom. They want to be, they want to be able to teach, and that's what we need to do is to restore that we need to let the parents have a say in the curriculum, and we always have to stay focused on the student, have the money follow the student. So if we can fix our education system, if we can get those students reading by grade level at grade three, and the West Virginia legislature has done a good job of starting that with ensuring we have assistance put into the first grade, second grade, third grade, that program is in place. So we are addressing these things. But then we need to look at uh, I, I like to use the model that Toyota does, that in high school, uh, they, they bring students in as interns, and they give them an unassembled bike, and they let the students put these together so they learn tools, they learn working with their hands, they learn the pride of uh, a worksmanship, and that bike you know, is able to be ridden by a child, and they give it away to 
charity and that sort of thing. It's just a great involvement between the business and the community and the students. Then you go to the leadership uh, the academy, basically, that they have uh, at the uh, junior college level. Uh, we need more uh, a push and emphasis on folks that may not need to go to college. Their, their interest is somewhere else, the uh, vocational careers. We need to emphasize that. So uh, there is so much more that we can be doing in the educational arena. And if we fix that, then you have a work-ready workforce that's ready to be employed. And that's what the employers all around the state are looking for. Uh, you have the education. They're not as apt to get into drugs and the problems, obesity and that sort of thing. They understand about health and the necessity of taking care of yourself. We can encourage people to get involved. You may, some of you may remember the John Kennedy uh, initiative for physical education back in the 60, 1960 when he got elected. Every child, if they could pass a certain physical fitness test, they would get a patch. I got one of those, and I'm so proud of it. We can encourage that kind of thing. Um, at the schools. And then finally, I mentioned the vocational careers. I saw one high school that had an actual um, construction site inside the school where people, the kids could go and they could nail two by fours together, they could put in insulation, they could pour concrete, they could do welding. A high school kid that maybe had lost interest in some of the, uh, you know, the courses but sees the product of their hands. It's not just what we used to do to see in woodworking class, it, it's much more than that. We can do that here in West Virginia and uh, have a workforce that's ready to go out and do plumbing, do welding, do uh, HVAC repair, uh, because, but we have to incentivize that, and we have to incentivize entrepreneurship. So there's so, I have so many ideas. Uh, my wife is introducing legislation along with Matt Rohrbach in this session right now uh, with regards to uh, computers in the classroom all the way up and down, cybersecurity all the way from first grade. Uh, through 12th grade uh, to make sure that that because the internet and cybersecurity is so much a part of uh, our day-to-day -day life uh, we need to make sure our students in West Virginia are right up to speed on that so I really appreciate that question but I think that's what the distinction is between me and some of the other candidates is I have this vision for where we need, need to go with education and that flows right over into the opioid crisis energy uh, to for the, for the jobs uh, that West Virginia uh, needs, and uh, then that all builds the economy. So I have this all tied together. Be glad to talk to you at length, you know, at some other time. Mac, uh, how do people find out more about your campaign for governor? MacWarner.com. It's uh, very easy. MacWarner.com. Please come to it and uh, look at the website and uh, get all the information you need there. And if not, just contact me directly. Uh, thank you, Mac. We enjoyed interviewing your brother, by the way, too. Uh, he said he had a lot he had to overcome because of the incompetency of the incumbent. <laughs> <laughs> he, didn't, he didn't actually oh, say that. Man. No. There, there you go. The <laughs> yeah. Rob's influence. He, he, yeah, I'm just making that. <laughs> hey, Mac, thanks. Always great to talk with you, sir. Great being with you all. Thanks. You Merry too. Christmas, Everyone. Mac. Okay. Same to you all. Bye.